welcome back, regular viewers. This is Wednesday Night Sessions. I am your host, Mitch Nobis. Coming to you, you can tell it's an evening session because I'm in the basement office, uh, joined by our Gus Macker Good Sportsmanship Trophy from 1980-something, I don't know seven eight i don't know a while ago i'm old by the way uh so <laughs> that was uh that dates me there a little bit uh joining us tonight is uh, i love the episodes where we get the michigan expats we have a former michigander matt bell joining us he's now in arizona and his new novel Appleseed uh has just come out uh so he's going to uh join us and do some reading from his new book and then we'll have some questions afterwards like always and matt i'll let you introduce yourself so ladies and gentlemen matt bell great thanks so much miss thanks everybody uh, I completely forgot Gus Macker was like a thing that exists, but it was such a consuming thing at a certain age. It's really funny to be reminded of that. Um, yeah, uh, that's great. Um, well, yeah, I'm great. Glad to be here and uh, happy to read from Appleseed. Um, I think I'll just kind of get into it. I'm just going to read the beginning so you don't need to know too much. But uh, the book takes place over about a thousand years. So it's long environmental uh, speculative epic. It starts in 1799 in Ohio. Um, one of the, uh, the originating ideas of the book was, uh, I was reading Michael Pollan's The Botany of Desire, and in that he talks about the apple, he's talking about Johnny Appleseed, who is one of my favorite sort of folklore figures when I was a kid. Um, and in that book, Pollan says, uh, starts talking about, uh, Johnny Appleseed as like a Dionysian figure. And I thought, oh, wouldn't it be funny if he was like literally a Dionysian figure and you wrote like a... Uh, Johnny Appleseed that was a Greek faun or satyr uh, from myth. Um, and so that's where this novel began. And, uh, and you'll hear that in this, uh, this excerpt. Thank you. Chapman wakes in the cold and the dark and the wet pre-dawn slush to the sound of his brother, Nathaniel, already up and tending to the sputtering ashes of last night's fire, cursing and shivering, huddled beneath his only blanket. Despite Nathaniel's ministrations, the coals beneath the ashes stay dead, the gathered wood wet, breakfast impossible. Shelling himself out from his bedroll, Chapman rises to, offering his brother a grunted good morning before stamping his cloven hooves against the frigid ground, trying to quicken blood sluggish with sleep. As first light breaks, he stalks silently away from their campsite, climbing the last ridgeline of this Pennsylvanian mountain pass, to watch the night's rainfall trickle off into morning mist, admiring the fine accidental melody of clean water falling branch to branch. A moment later, dutiful Nathaniel follows along, dragging their bags and tools to where Chapman waits upon his outcropping of rock, one clawed hand raised to shield his golden eyes as he surveys the forest they'll cross today. Snowpack still jamming the forest shadows, sparkling ice coating its swampy glacial kettles and its irregular lakes. All this waiting beauty backlit now by the red shroud of sunrise, the new day's dawning setting aglow, a vast world not yet fully explored. This brother, Nathaniel says, placing one calloused hand on taller Chapman's bare brown shoulder, waving the other out over the territory below. This is where we'll make our fortune. Pointing out the first landmarks that are due to pass today, he traces a path out of this mountain gap and down through the slim strand of tilled earth that gives, gives entrance to the Ohio territory, then the way beyond into the unsettled, unmapped forest swamps of the interior, past the river bottomlands and sheltered ravines where they sowed last year's nurseries toward the next uninhabited acres where they'll aim to plant this year's seeds. As Nathaniel happily details his plans, Chapman smiles his much practiced smile, his sharp teeth sliding from behind his broad lips. Look, brother, he interrupts, pointing out dim campfires barely visible through the morning mist, flickers of flame and smoke rising in far off sheltered dales. There are so many more of us this year. Every year, these fires move deeper into the landscape, each one a distant sign of strangers come to expand the human mark to put the land to what Nathaniel has taught Chapman are its rightful uses. Here are settlers hunting and trapping and gathering wild foodstuffs, cutting down trees and tearing up rocks to make room for placeholder farms, making way for the, making way for the towns to come. 
while others tap trees for sap and hang tin sugaring buckets over hot coals, sometimes passing the time with amateur fiddling, the inviting sounds of their instruments carrying across even the most desolate, starless, moonless nights. Together, the brothers measure again the increasingly believable potential of this territory, its wilderness cleared by war, then emptied by treaty. As he has at the start of every other year's journey, Nathaniel tells Chapman again how this taken land can now be brought to heel by industrious men, how by many hands the foundations of a new civilization will be laid here, the land year by year made ready for the coming of more people, until one day the uncultivated earth gives way to what he says will surely be the grandest of cities, each graced by the tallest buildings and the widest avenues, all populated by an endless parade of hardy settlers planting horizon-busting fields of wind-tilted golden grain, harvesting fruitful orchards planted by these two forward-thinking brothers. Chapman and Nathaniel and these others gathered around their distant fires are only the first to come, he says. Even if our industries should fail entirely, Nathaniel concludes, surely we will, be not, we will not be the last. Nathaniel has said this for 10 years now, the same lines recited from the same mountain pass at the outset of each year's venture. It's time to go, Chapman says, suddenly impatient with his brother's story. He ties his bedroll and his tools over one bare shoulder, slings his leather seed bag around the other. The morning air is chill and damp, but the bark of his skin keeps him warm enough that even in winter he wears no shirt or coat, only a pair of trousers hacked off above his inhuman knees. He dusts the last of the night's frost from his flanks, then whinnies lowly, stretching tall to rub the smooth shells of his curved horns with his clawed hands, first his broken horn and then his intact twin for luck. Nathaniel laughs, then mimics his brother's superstitions, rubbing his own bare temples, where just recently a few gray hairs started creeping through the brown. Meet you at the river, Nathaniel teases, sidestepping onto the narrow trace path leading down the ridge line, if you can catch me. He rushes to build his slim head start, but his advantage doesn't last long. A moment later, Chapman surges past him to drop down the steep plunge of the mountainside, his hooves sliding precariously on loose scree as he picks up speed, the joy of moving fast filling him from the inside out, his fur standing on end, his heart leaping with happy effort. He quickens his pace with every step until a barking cry rips free of him, the sound of his voice foreign enough to this territory and every other to frighten all the nearby roosting birds into sudden startled flight, the gray sky filling with their black silhouettes, their many cries joining the whooping of this one fawn returned at last to wildest lands. As many years as Chapman's made this passage out of Pennsylvania, the splendor of arriving in the territory has never ceased to provoke his fullest wonder. Propelled by joy, he runs dangerously this morning, his fur legs taking leaping, straining steps, his splayed hooves seeking purchase on sharp juddings of quivering rocks, on old growth roots thrust through black earth and slushy snow, other obstacles threatening to trip him and send him sprawling. When his descent smooths, onto more level ground, he increases his speed again, his few possessions bang rhythmically against his muscular torso as all around him the forest deepens. The sun has only a pale power beneath these trees where the frontier's every shaded feature is a fresh barrier to progress. Searching for the way forward, Chapman follows a trail trampled by first peoples or fur trappers or single file processions of deer, the path a barely visible scrawl plodding the way forward, then crosses dry strands of seasonal creeks strewn with the lacy bones of trout, an unremembered stream quickening with snowmelt. He encounters a thicket impassable except by hacking out each halting step with his tomahawk. He leaps fallen columns of oak and maple, vaults lichen-stung trunks, maybe giving shelter to squirming snakes, the only animals he can't abide. His movements scatter squirrels and chipmunks playing amid rotted leaves, forest mice leaping hungrily over melting snow. Once an explosion of foxes appears, a half dozen pups running through the flattened grass of a meadow, once purpled with loose strife, yellowed with goldenrod. In the moist underbrush, 
He spies the year's first warty toads hopping hungrily through the moldings of mud rattlers and the pellets of horned owls. Abundance everywhere, everywhere gathering and joy and predation and sorrow. Amid all this untamed splendor, every acre of forest is an empire in the shape of the world. Wherever Chapman ventures next, there waits some unnamed waterway or unexplored meadow, some ridge never described, never made anyone's landmark, or so he once believed, come late to this landscape, cleared of its most recent inhabitants. Now he just as frequently exits untouched woods to find newly planted lands, the forest brambles burned back, its glacier spilled stones stacked into makeshift garden walls, so many trees felled to make rough sawn boards, boards nailed into unsound hope, unsound houses held upright by mortar and tar and hope. New construction makes Chapman nervous, long in habitation doubly so. From his youngest days, he could follow a wooded trail haphazardly stamped, fl stamped flat, but couldn't abide a road cleared by men with picks and shovels and mules. He could skirt the edges of farms, but couldn't cross their fenced in fields without his skin aching with hives, his bones burning in their sockets. Only after Nathaniel hit on the idea of planting frontier orchards, did Chapman begin to better acculturate himself. Their nurseries tucked amid the wilder cousins, easing his flesh to the idea of the domesticated. Nathaniel stands of apple trees wild enough for Chapman to pass, for Chapman to pass among them as long as the trees are planted from seeds never grafted. By midday, he reaches the river he seeks, the sun emerging over its clear, fast course, its waterline raised by snow melt and spring rains. He squats over his hooves to scan the sparkling water for signs of trout coming up to feed on the gathering insects, hungry for their pleasurable slap and splash, then picks a tick from his fur, squeezing the pin of its head with clawed fingers, the pressure not enough to kill it, but certainly to make it release. Half wild as he is, he doesn't count himself as one of the forest creatures, but anything afflicting them might afflict him too. A lesson painfully learned his first wet season in the territory when he caught a hoof rot, Nathaniel treated as he would any common goats with dreadful cuttings than the application of stinking herbal salves. Waiting for Nathaniel, Chapman swings his bag around his bare frame, rests it above his bony knees. He pulls it open, even though he shouldn't. The seeds could easily dry out, despite the moist pumice and pulp. And then he plunges his head into the bag's opening, breathes deep the wet ferment inside. Around him are a thousand fresher scents, all the ter territory's perfumes and poisons, promises and provocations but Chapman's favorite is the one he carries lashed to his chest, kept contained within his satchel. Not the attractive smell of apples ready to be picked, not the smell becoming taste of an apple bitten, but this rotten stinking hope, the intoxicating promise of what next? The tree, the tree, the tree. Taste and smell are almost the same sense, even in memory, even in dream. With his face buried in the leather bag, Chapman imagines the taste smell of the apple of the tree. He tells himself it's possible to plant, to grow, to harvest one glowing apple from, one apple all he'll need to change his life. Let Nathaniel make his fortune if he can. All Chapman wants is one particular apple. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. That was outstanding. Um, oh, thanks. I, I just love the like the the pastoral abundance, like the scene with like the foxes frolicking and everything. It's like it's I don't know. Maybe it's because we're both Midwestern guys by by uh, you know <laughs> origin, but it just I, I'm from a farm originally, so it's like you know that the description was very rich and just kind of took me home in a weird way. I mean, I you know I don't have cloven yeah, hooves, but. Yet. Uh, <laughs> But we did have foxes frolicking, so I had that far. Um, so that was just a gorgeous piece and, and definitely a great teaser for the novel. So thank you for sharing that uh, particular segment. Um, Appleseed is also uh, well over 600 pages. I, um, I don't remember the exact like number. 480, but, but it's pieces. big. Yeah. Oh, 480. <laughs> okay. I looked it up. Uh, Amazon or somebody oh, had a different funny. number. Yeah, I apologize. Yeah. Um, 
but but you know m- many books this is kind of a running debate like on twitter and whatnot among writers like what's the right book length um and i think i saw someplace that you were defending the yeah. long book right so what's what's the advantage of the long book over you know like kind of your standard most books are about 300 ish sure. pages seems to be the target yeah i mean it seems like if you want to like uh win like a pulitzer or something you should write a 180 page book or like a thousand page book you know so i think like, <laughs> yeah. like so you know the, the middle is the hard part like you know the the 500 page book is a weird length but um you know in this case i uh i the book's long partly because it has three uh timelines it takes place in in like the end of the 18th century and then in a near future and then in like a far future like 700 years in our future and so it's kind of a triple world build and for me one of the reasons for that was to um uh talking about climate change and, and things like that and wanting to be able to depict like over a long period of time as opposed to like one september in 2021 or something you know um and so it just takes more time there's a way in which it's it's kind of a triple novel you know that there's sort of these three distinct things um i don't know i think there's there's uh there's something wonderful being immersed in a world for a long time um i don't know if this happened to you but i did a lot of like comfort reading over the pandemic especially sort of in the early thing kind of return to things i like and uh something great about a book that lets you like live in it for a month or stay in it for a while as opposed to like you know something great about a book you can read in a day but i don't think that's the only kind of book i want you know i, I want to have that sort of room um my uh, my initial pandemic reading project was I reread Stephen King's Dark Tower books, uh, which are I think like four four thousand three hundred pages when you read the whole thing. You know, oh, yeah. um, it was months, right? I just at it forever reading it, and it was kind of wonderful to like just like live there for a bit. Uh, and I think there's something great about the long book that the short book doesn't do because it's it's a different experience. Right, and we get so conditioned to kind of like a the straightforward three-act structure of like okay so the end must be coming soon and like with, with a longer book you, you kind of get tripped a couple of times right like oh this this must be how it ends and it's like no there's a whole we're, we're just right. running <laughs> off we're heading off somewhere else for a while now and and it's it sort of um i appreciate them in especially in our contemporary society right now and we try to even in the middle of a pandemic we're trying to rush everything like yeah. you know, the biology has forced us to slow down and like people are bristling at it and refusing there's some are outright refusing right and i think that's like the real strength of the long book is it forces you out of that you know you've got to take take that deep breath and take a step back and like okay fine so the book's not almost over we're just yet another complication then you settle in and just sort of yeah like you said it takes you um you kind of live in it for a while yeah and you know i don't think length has to be an indicator of sort of uh of difficulty or, or, or the speed of the book. I mean, I think this book is faster than my other books. I think I learned how to write like a faster story or yeah. maybe a certain way, um, which is one of the reasons I can get away with a longer book than I used to. You know, I think right. um, the, the first draft of uh, my first novel, which is about half the length of this one, was the size this is in print, right? And, you know, and sort of like it wasn't, but it wasn't, it shouldn't have been that length, right? It's like yeah. the 500 page version of that book was a very bad book. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and sort of learning how to how to keep things moving briskly, even when it's long. Um, yeah, I don't think it's it's length that is, is a, you know, sometimes density is hard, but I don't think yeah. length by itself is a sign of difficulty. There's lots of long books that read faster than plenty of short stories, right? You right. Know? Yeah. yeah. And, that, and that's, I always kind of laugh when those those debates pop up on social media. It's like, it's, it's about the book, you know? It's like, I teach high school and, you know, in, in summer reading, kids always want like, what's the quickest thing? So they'll pick Heart of Darkness. Like, you know, guys, <laughs> short, short doesn't mean fast. Oh God, yeah. Heart of Darkness is in every way a difficult book, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and like on the beach, no less. Like this is for summer reading. It's like, no, tr- trust me <laughs> on this, you know? Yeah. Many of the longer books will take you a fraction of the time to read. Um, awesome. And then the second question. Uh, so you're in Arizona now, originally a Michigander. Um, and these are two, you know, you're talking about like climate and, and geography in your own book, right? So these are two very different uh, ecosystems in, in literal and figurative ways, right? Um, so if you could take any element from Michigan and, and lug it out to Arizona with you, you could transplant some element of your home state out to Arizona, what would it be? Oh, water, obviously. <laughs> I mean, I'm thinking like Coney Dogs or like Motown, like the dog water. Yeah. Oh my God, what I'd give to see a lake or a river, you know? Um, 
there's two natural lakes in, in Arizona. All the other lakes are, are man-made. Like, I mean, there's just like not much water, you know? Um, and, uh, and I miss that sort of desperately. And weather, I mean, I think like, you know, we have monsoon season, but like we don't really have real weather. Um, the, uh, the first year I lived here, I got this like weird melancholy that was sort of, uh, I think because every day looked like every other day. Yeah. Like, you know, it felt like time wasn't passing. Cause it was just like, oh, it's another hot sunny day. Um, and, uh, and at some point I even like uh, was having, I was having trouble writing and I realized I wasn't like dreaming. And I, I think there was like, I wasn't having my memories triggered by the passing of time. You know, there's like that first day where it smells like fall and you're like, oh, football season. And you think of like being in high school and you like all that stuff that is part of your interior mental landscape brushes back. And I was just like experiencing the same Arizona day over and over. And then the second year it was like, oh, this reminds me of the last fall here. And I, and then that connected to other falls and I was fine. But I had to go through a whole year before I could even like kind of be myself here. It was really weird. Like I think weather and water, I mean, you know, um, which is, I guess, probably defines the Midwest to some extent, but. Uh, right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, so all of it. And um, <laughs> and probably Michigan beer too, although we do have, have some very good breweries here too, but Michigan's pretty hard to beat. I mean, the Bell's Brewery is, you know, the pinnacle. You get Oberon all year round in Arizona, though. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, which feels like a slight of some kind. I don't know how it works. It, yeah, it's wrong. There should it's be unnatural. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Talk about there not being seasons, right? Like we don't even have Oberon seasons. It's just, it's just oh. available. That, that's kind of sad. Like it's, it's the middle of the big rollout here right now in right. Michigan. Like they, it's, they're trying to make it a holiday. I think you know. <laughs> You still have hop slam season. So, you know, I mean, you still get to celebrate something, but yeah, yeah. It is a little weird just to see Oberon all the time. Yeah. 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 Well, and it ties right into what you were saying with, you know, the, everybody, right. the Groundhog's Day. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's such an interesting answer. I wouldn't have thought of that. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, hey, Matt, thank you very much for joining us. Um, your, your old Michigan stopping grounds, uh, say hi. And uh, everybody's looking forward to the new book. So again, viewers, uh, Appleseed is the book you're looking for. And Matt, thanks for joining us again. Thanks so much, Miss. Thanks, everybody, for being here. All right. We'll see, uh, see the viewers next time. Take care.